Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 140. This episode is with one of the most interesting people I have ever had the pleasure to hang with. It's Mariana Van Zeller. She is a journalist, a documentarian, and a woman with zero fear. You may know her best from her Peabody award-winning documentary, The Oxycontin Express, or from her many, many documentaries covering all kinds of black markets. And we talked about almost all of it. We talk about how she's originally from Portugal and how she decided she wanted to become a journalist at 12 years old, then how she moved to go to Columbia University one month before 9-11 happened. How's that for timing? We talk about her having to go live on TV during that, how that experience made her want to start making documentaries in the first place. Uh, We talk about how she decides on her topics, how she sees the world, and how she deals with some of the more difficult topics she's covered. Mariana is a fascinating person who's just a delight to chat with. Uh, she's also got a new show out now on Net Geo called Trafficked with Mariana Van Zeller, and it's so good. I've seen the first five episodes, and whew, they just get better and better. They really do. Be sure to check that out on National Geographic Wednesday nights at 9, 8 central. Then check out the Trafficked podcast wherever you get podcasts on Thursdays to hear Mariana interview previous traffickers as well. You're going to love it. It's crazy. But before you do that, get to know Mariana a little better with this podcast. So... Without further ado, please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, episode number 140 with Mariana Van Zeller. Theme song time. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing good. I'm uh, uh, getting more nervous as the premiere date approaches. Uh, yeah, I bet. But I'm good. I'm generally doing very good. We're also in the midst of filming season two already. Oh, no uh, way. Crazy busy. Yeah, since July. Wow. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Do you, are you good with free time? I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> You should see me during quarantine. I was oh, really? <laughs> I get it. I get it. <laughs> I I find that that's pretty common though with a lot of people that are like the more creative type. Like you got to stay busy, you know. So quarantine's been a weird a weird time to try and navigate. To be like, I, what do I what do I do now? Huh. So I don't try and put my efforts into cooking. Turns out. Oh, was, smart. Was lack of efforts is just t- total utter lack of ta- talent yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm terrible at cooking i don't like it though i think that makes a difference you know i think i think so too i yeah. think that and 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 having you know even when you're reading a recipe i realized the other day i had, couldn't figure out why i sucked at this because yeah. i thought just reading a recipe but <laughs> there's there's an important tip to that which i didn't know my husband told me you have to read the recipe until the end before oh you do you I, no, I don't. I get very impatient immediately. I start reading <laughs> crack eggs. I'm cracking eggs immediately. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I, I've ruined so many dinners doing exactly that. But I'm like, I did half the cup. That's what it said. It goes, no. It said grab half a cup, use a fourth, and then later use the other fourth. Yes. Oh. Yes. Exactly. That well, where crazy. do you want to get food from? <laughs> Not from my kids. Yeah, yeah, I, I I'm the same way. We we started this Hello Fresh recently, like in the last couple of years, and I I will say I've gotten better, but that's not saying much compared to where I started. Um, it's the thing is I think they assume with these recipes sometimes that you already know how to cook. Do you feel that? I have never done one of those, but isn't that sort of like paint by color? Isn't that like well? The easy- listen, now you're making me feel bad about it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> It's, I mean, maybe it is if you know how to cook already. That's the thing. It's like, just do this. And I'm like, okay, why does mine look gross? I did what it said. It's, uh, cooking's not for me. I can't do it. I can't do it. It doesn't work. Me neither. Sheesh. But we've survived somehow so far. So that's good. We're that still, is good. We're still here. I'm lucky I live with two men and they do all the cooking in the house. And Smart. That's fine by me. Smart. I need to do that. 
cooked. My my wife does not like cooking either, so we're in a lose lose situation. <laughs> <laughs> I can I can send you my dad or my father. Uh, yeah, if my you don't dad mind. Or my husband. <laughs> you know, whichever one is more patient, I'll take that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's gonna be tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I understand. I understand. Did you? I, so I know you're from Portugal. What is that like? Because I've never been and I've always wanted to go. It is the most beautiful country in the world. No, I, uh, I, I, I talk about Portugal all the time. Like people get very annoyed that I talk about <laughs> Portugal all the time when I'm here. But then when I do go to Portugal, I talk about the U.S. all the time. And, uh, <laughs> I'm crazy about my new country as well. Sure. Uh, it's a beautiful country. It's, uh, it's a really special little place. It's, uh, you know, managed to maintain its independence from the rest of Spain that try to conquer it for hundreds of years and we're sort yeah. of feisty yeah. little people that uh, yeah. kept our independence and uh, also sort of explore the world you know at one point we'd uh, we like I think we owned like half of the world was ours considered part of the Portuguese uh, kingdom uh, love it and uh, so we've got we were, we're explorers at heart and I definitely think I have part of that DNA in me uh, my son is actually called Vasco, after Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer. Um, oh, I love it. Yeah, yeah. So now it's, it's a cool country. You, sh you should visit. It's very cool. Done, done. I, yeah, that, hearing you talk about that, I, I'm seeing a thread here. That makes a lot of sense. <laughs> you, you've experienced quite a bit of the world. I, I, yeah, I, that was my, that, my goal. From when I was a kid, that's what I wanted to do. I decided very early on I wanted to be a journalist. I wanted to travel the world, and I wanted to sort of connect with people all around the world. Sure. And I realized that the best way to do it was by becoming a journalist. Really? So even as a kid, you wanted to be a journalist? Yeah, I decided when I was twelve. Wow, that's I told cool. Told my parents. Yeah, I told my parents, "This is it. I want to be a journalist," and uh, pretty much stayed the course from then. Wow. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's something to be said about the persistence of having a dream and then really making it happen. Yeah. And it wasn't always easy. You know, one of the stories that I tell often, because I, I think it shows one of the most important characteristics in a journalist, I think, which is persistence. Exactly. Yeah. Was uh, I graduated from school in Portugal and I uh, knew I wanted to go to Columbia University's journalism school because I knew I wanted to move to the U.S. and do journalism here. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't accepted the first year and I wasn't accepted the third, the, the second year. And the third year I flew to New York and I oh. knocked on the dean's door and I introduced myself and we sat down and spoke for an hour in that year. I was accepted and it was one of the happiest days of my life, but it also taught me sort of the first and most important lesson in journalism, which is persistence and wow. don't give up. Yeah. Man. So Columbia, you were like, this is, this is the one. And you this went for it. This is the one. Yeah. I wow. applied to, to a few others. Uh, and I, I think I, I did, I got accepted into a couple, but I, uh, was not, I knew it was Columbia. That it was it um, that or nothing. Man. Yeah, and that's, Actually, eventually where I met my husband. So it was a good choice. Hey, it, it choice. worked out, I think. Many levels, yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Because you, correct me if I'm wrong, you had worked in like news beforehand. I had uh, worked at a TV station in Portugal, sort of the largest commercial TV station in Portugal. Um, I interned in sort of the news desk for a little bit, but then was hired to work for their travel show. So I traveled around the world oh. um, doing travel stories, but realized as I was interviewing a couple on their honeymoon in the Maldives, in this beautiful paradise of a beach, I yeah. realized, ah, oh, this is not for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> there's not enough danger here <laughs> i was just so much more uh interested and curious about what was happening behind the resorts and in sort of the real life sure. of these. um yeah so i i came back and again uh continued with my dream of columbia and that was my way out of the travel show <laughs> smart smart you dipped your toes in a little bit you're like do i really want to travel the world yes but i want to see travel the underworld wasn't good exactly enough. i respect exactly i respect it. that a lot mariana i respect that yeah thank you thank you columbia <laughs> not bad not bad and so what year did you get to columbia then 2001 uh, i arrived in oh, columbia no. yeah uh august uh, oh two or no three weeks later 9 11 happened um wow yeah it's uh i'd been working until late the night before 
uh, working on a project for Columbia the night before until super late. And at 9 a.m., 9 something, my phone, I had, to, you know, the landline and the little uh, cell phone started ringing nonstop. And eventually I picked up and it was actually the TV station that I worked for in Portugal telling me, oh. hey, you are the only Portuguese journalist that we know that's in Manhattan right now. You have to go to Midtown to the rooftop of this building where journalists from around the world are gathered and you have to go live to, for Portuguese television in, in an hour or something like that. Holy and on the other land, line and the landlord line is my mom uh, desperately crying and yeah. me telling her that, you know, that I had to go and do this reporting and my mom crying and begging me to stay at home and not leave the house. And, uh, but I went and then got up to this rooftop midtown, you know, again, some of my heroes all around me, people that I've grown up watching on television. Yeah. And so nervous. I was a nervous wreck. It was so, I so bet. Oh, I was 24 years old or so. Oh. Way too much makeup on. <laughs> dressed in a ridiculous outfit. <laughs> you had and short was, notice. I'll give you that. Oh, you totally. know. <laughs> so nervous. And then I went live and I did my thing. And then I walked down to the streets after, you know, doing my live feeds. And uh, started seeing the first signs of people sort of looking for their missed ones. And uh, that's Ooh. when it sort of really like hit me. And um, that was a defining moment for me. It's I bet. Of, yeah. When I realized what kind of journalism I wanted to do was then. Wow. What cosmic timing is that? Yeah. That's crazy. Man. It's, yeah. I that's one of my favorite thing when talking to people like, the, the the added benefit I get from my show is like seeing the threads in people's lives. I'm like, oh, look. And then, oh, it's like finding yeah. constellations, you know? Yeah, And absolutely. it's crazy that at 12, you're like, I want to travel the world. I want to do this journalism. You get to the Maldives, you're like, I want to do some crazy journalism. And then you <laughs> get to New York a month. Wow. Yeah. What is your life? That's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty crazy. And then like a, a year and a half later, I was, uh, I moved to Syria, to the Middle East, the war in Iraq had started. I knew I wanted oh. to be close to the action. And uh, yeah, moved to Syria. Ooh, yeah. Everything has been done. Yeah. yeah. And I know you know a lot of languages. Did you know anything in, because Syria, that's Arabic, isn't it? Yeah, I enrolled in the University of Damascus to learn Arabic. But here's the thing that I don't think most people know is that this was before the war in Syria. This war was actually happening in Iraq, not Syria. Sure. At the time. And Damascus was a party city. Um, oh. There was a small community of foreigners <laughs> living there, mostly learning Arabic. Uh, a lot, you know, I made friends very fast and we were sort of all enrolled in the University of Damascus. And uh, it turns out that partying uh, took over learning Arabic. So I fair, was able to fair. converse in Arabic at the time uh, mm -hmm. while living there. I was able to have conversations, um, but I've lost it all. Um, That's so, yeah, so Arabic is not one of my languages, yeah. unfortunately. <laughs> that doesn't count. You, you can ask where the bathroom is, but that's pretty much all yeah. we need. Yes, exactly. exactly. Understandable. It's important. That is an important phrase to know in every language, I find. It yeah. is a very important yes. <laughs> <laughs> That. Get out of here fast. <laughs> yeah. I, oh, I bet. I bet. That's crazy. So at that point, you'd seen quite a bit of the world already. I have. Yeah. I, wow. I've, uh, yeah. I've traveled all around nonstop sometimes. Yeah. So, there, it doesn't there, get boring. doesn't get old. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the key. It's true. Yeah. Keep running. Keep running. Yeah. Is, is there a place that you haven't been yet that you really want to try? There actually, you know, there is. Uh, yeah. Mongolia. There is. I have a Google alert from Mongolia, um, which uh, on a weekly basis, I get all the news of everything that's happening in Mongolia because I'm desperately trying to find a way, a story that I can, an excuse yeah. to get to Mongolia for a story. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a different side of the planet if you were to start coloring in. Yeah. But yeah, that's not bad. That's not bad. Yeah. Do you yeah. have one? Yeah, I, I want to go to New Zealand. I've never oh, been. Good. Yeah. Yeah. It was originally Ireland, I'll say, but then I went to Ireland. That's my favorite place. I love yeah. Ireland so really much. Really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Lord of the Rings yeah. was all New Zealand. It's like. Yes, Lord of the Rings, of what? course. All New what? Zealand. One day. One day. Yeah. And yeah. Australia. I just want to go to the other side of the planet just yeah. to say I did it. You know what I mean? Yeah, you'll be there, and I'll wave from Mongolia. Perfect. That's what we'll do. We'll we'll synchronize our phones to where we get alerts when the other one goes to that place. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> we'll figure it out. We'll yeah, figure it out. That's the goal. I love traveling as well. I think I think it's important. I tell people all the time, like especially Americans. I was like, I think it's really important for us to go out into the world and see things that are different, and then it opens your. I think traveling just makes you a better person because you're you're seeing other people and different ways of life, and it's like, oh right, you can step outside of yourself. You know what I mean? Absolutely. I think it's the most important character changing tool out there. Um, I really do. Um, I think it sort of really opens up, like you were saying, our perspectives are, you know, are you just like start, you know, traveling and learning about the world and you come back and you realize uh, so much more about your own world in a way, you know, yeah. when, when it's it's truly you come back with a completely different perspective, you know, even about your own life and your own world. Um, and and in many cases, I mean, especially in the sort of places that I go to, you just stop complaining, you know, <laughs> about That's the little good point. things. Yeah, you just realize, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't be complaining about this. It's not, it's not right. Um, sure. Yeah. So you just, you uh, just see it differently. It's it's yeah. perspective. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. I agree. And you get cool stories yeah. from it, which I think is the whole point of life. You know, yeah. sit back and tell people like, oh, right, I remember this time I did this and it was awful. But it's nice to talk about now. <laughs> yeah. And the incredible people you meet. All day. I mean, all about the people at the end of the day. It's, yeah, uh, I totally agree. You can learn from them. It's incredible. Yeah, totally agreed. So then at what point did you decide uh, from being like a journalist to being like a documentarian? Because it's it's journalism, but it's like a different mm -hmm. medium to do it. You know, it what I mean? is. Yeah, it was that day. It was nine eleven. It was going out on the really? streets and seeing people with their signs looking for loved ones. Um, that had obviously profound impacts on me. And um, I realized, okay, so this sort of live feeds and uh, nightly news reporting, although I realize it's super important, it's not what I want to do. I I really wanted to sort of contextualize it more. Um, and uh, and have more time to spend in these worlds and try to understand how they operate the way they are do and and that's yeah that's I decided I, I then went and did a, a major in uh, I did my first documentary at while at Columbia University one of their Perfect. documentary classes um, it won the documentary of the year that year hey <laughs> I know it was good I was so happy and then uh, and then that led one thing to the other went worked at a production company in London for a year oh, and sweet. then. Uh, the war in Iraq started and I went to Syria and I started doing my first freelance stories from Syria. Um, yeah. And it was more documentaries, essentially. It started wow. with mini docs and now we're in sort of longer form doc documentaries. Sure. Is there, do you find that there's like a formula for how to make a documentary or is it like art that like there's a million ways to do it? It can kind of go either way. There's a million ways to do it, but at the end yeah. of the day, it's all about storytelling. There's no perfect, uh, you know, uh, recipe. There's no what? What is it? The green, fresh green. Yeah. Recipe <laughs> There's no Hello Fresh card. Fresh direct. Don't trust fresh them anyway. <laughs> Don't listen to them, Mariana. But listen, I'm telling you, it's frustrating. <laughs> there isn't. There isn't just one way to do it. But in the end of the day, it's just about storytelling because, you know, it's super important to be out reporting on these stories, but it's also equally important to have people watch them. Uh, ultimately, True. because you want to impact. So. You have to make them, um, you know, not only be important, but also compelling storytelling stories that people want to watch, documentaries that people want to sit down, take an hour of their lives to watch. Um, so, yeah, I'd say that's always the most grueling part of the job, for sure, is when you come back with all the material and now, okay, now we have to sort of what we call in the industry, we say kill the baby, kill our babies, because yeah. we have all this amazing content, right? And we have to kill our babies sure. and then put something together that people want to watch. Wow. I, yeah, I never thought about that because you think the story itself to you who's covering the story is compelling enough as is, but you do have to package it to make what yeah. you need people to be interested in the story. And wow, yeah. I never thought about that. And you have to be fair and balanced and you have to, you know, make sure that you're getting things right and you you need to make sure, um, you know, just that you're doing equal parts interesting uh, and equal parts, uh, you know, compelling and adventurous and wild and you want people to be glued to the TV. So that's not always an easy task. Right, right. Wow. I'm seeing how the sausage is made. Cooking term <laughs> pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> 
who keep with the cooking. That's right. Here we go. <laughs> the whole podcast. That's right. <laughs> That's that is fascinating though. Do you find it's hard? Like, is it difficult to cover something and then try and find a way to make a story? Because you're covering just what is, right? But then you have to that sounds like it'd be really hard. Yeah, you it's you can't you know we film sometimes like you know 80 hours of television for example oh. we can't come back and just put the 80 hours together and show <laughs> sure. it so we have to then figure out a way to make those 80 hours into a one concise hour of tele concise interesting compelling again all those same words sure. hours of television and that's where you have to figure out you know what goes where and how do you make the transitions interesting and how how do you make it also uh, easy to understand because sometimes we are so, oh yeah, uh, you know, deep in these worlds or in these stories that we don't realize that that you know we also have to dissect it and make it easy for people to understand. Um, again, not not make some. It, essentially, it's like those amazing athletes that you see, like uh, you know, like ballet dancers, for example. You see them doing all these spins and twists and turns, and it looks so incredibly easy, right? Because they're oh, so yeah. good at it. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the more it feels like uh, it's an easy watch and you're not wondering how this got here and there, um, the better you are at your job. Interesting. Yeah, it has to be palatable for like yes. if somebody who doesn't know the ins and yes. outs of that thing. You can't be like, yeah. oh, it's this thing. You're like, yeah. I don't know what that thing is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. But at the same time, leave a little bit of, a, you know, leave a little bit of a, uh, space for for mystery because that also <laughs> right makes it compelling. it's again balance compelling man this sounds like a lot of work <laughs> <laughs> too much <Yeah>. no. <laughs> do you do you pick the topics or like how does how does this work yeah a lot of the vast majority uh were stories that I was interested in. In season one, uh, definitely the vast majority were stories that I was sort of curious about, you know, passionate about and uh, got with my team, but we pitched them and then National Geographic um, either says yes or no. The vast majority of times they say yes to the topics that we're interested in. And then I also have an incredible team um, that is way more talented than me that, uh, <laughs> that also- <laughs> that they're the ones really putting these stories together and a lot of times also pitching incredible ideas. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So it's like a, yeah. you go to a network or something and you have these ideas that you pitch them and they're like, yeah, okay, cool. And then you like come to them with the job as opposed to like a newsroom and you're like, here are the stories who wants what? Yes. As a freelance journalist, that is the case. And you get a lot of, you get so many no's actually. I was giving I you the example of what it's like to pitch episode yeah. <laughs> ideas for, for Nat Geo, but as a freelance journalist, having been one for many years, sure. it's, yeah, it's just knocking on people's, actually calling people and emailing <laughs> people nonstop and, uh, and getting no after no after no. And then, and then somebody eventually is going to say yes. And, and that was that the action. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. Not, or not, not hearing bad. back from somebody, not that never should dissuade you. I yeah. remember one sending a story to PBS to Frontline uh, back in the day as a freelance journalist and they never got back to me. And, uh, and then actually, actually as my husband, I was working with him at the time. He said, well, we should just call them. And we did. And they were like, oh, yeah, sorry. We, we somehow lost your email, but we think it's a brilliant <laughs> idea. And can you go out and do this tomorrow? <laughs> yes. That's all it takes. Sometimes you just got to follow up. Yeah, follow up. Follow up. I, I know the feeling. I know the feeling. With a, yeah. with a, with a guest-centric podcast, it is very easy to get lost in the shuffle. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm so sure. Many, so many places. So what do you do? Like, what do you do? Uh, it's the same thing. I show up at their house. Um <laughs> <laughs> I would try that. Sure. Yeah, I don't recommend it. It doesn't work very often. But when it does, it's worth it, I think. <laughs> I should totally try that. <laughs> you know, it's it I feel like it shows its own brand of persistence, you know. The law feels differently, but who's who's to say who's right in this? <laughs> There's a lot of places in the country that you can't go into anymore. That's, that's true. That's true. I can't legally say what they are on this, but they're there. <laughs> but I, I love it. I love looking at your resume as well because it's so, like, different, everything you've covered. I mean, you've covered, like, lobsters in Nicaragua to, like, the Cambo frog, which is cool, to, like, blood diamonds. Like, 
these do not, I don't see a line here of like, you're into this one thing. It just seems like you're a genuinely interested person, which I think cool. I am, but I would disagree with you on that. They're all black markets. All of them oh, are you found illegal, your umbrella. illicit trades. That's uh, a good point. Yeah. That's a good yeah. point. It has to be yeah. illegal for you to be interested. I, understand. <laughs> I, get it. I don't, I don't play around with legal. Yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. no, it's, you know, it's not, it's because I, you know, we don't realize, but the sort of the black markets and gray markets around us uh, have mm. such an impact on our daily lives. And yet sure. we know sure. very little about them. Uh, and they're all around us. Seriously. One of the things that I've discovered filming this is just how prevalent and widespread these markets are. Yeah. Um, and, and so once you realize, you know, one of the things that I say uh, is one of the impetus for filming this series for, for Nat Geo, and it came from sort of my experience as a journalist in these worlds for many mm -hmm. years, was realizing that there are whole networks and, you know, magazines and radio shows and whatnot devoted to analyzing everything about the formal economy, every twist and turn, up and down, everything. Right. And yet the black and gray markets actually make up for almost half of the global economy. What? Um, and there is no one actually, there's not a lot of uh, outlets out there, um, you know, either gaining access or, um, you know, showing a shining a light into these worlds. Um, so right. that for me was very important. And then once I started entering these worlds and reporting on them, it was a realization that there is a real, uh, that there, it's, they're not, there's sort of a, a um, an organization to the chaos. Um, sure. You know, it's, they're not all just happening by chance. There's, they are organized systems in place that are par parallel and very similar to formal economies and formal uh, legal organizations, for example. And for me, it became sort of important to, you know, peel the layers of that to see what, you know, the real world uh, looks like. Um, yeah. So it's, it's in that sense. That's fascinating. It is that that's yeah. one of my favorite things that you mentioned in this season is like it's right there. Like it, oh, it's a it's, it's a printing shop where it's just a day to day like a flea market but also millions of dollars. <laughs> You're like it's it's right here. You just have to show up at this time and you'll see it. That's oh, nuts. It, it is incredible. You know, I saw a couple of the scenes that we filmed happened, you know, 10 minutes from my house, just a few miles from my house here in Los really? Angeles. Yes, we filmed an arms trafficking deal happening. What? Just 15 minutes from my house, next to a freeway on a regular weeknight. Um, we saw a car being packed with AR-15s and AK-47s and handguns and being sent to Mexico, American guns. Um, we filmed, you know, a whole, uh, for we, one of the episodes was about sex trafficking, and we filmed with several pimps um, in the streets, also here in Los Angeles, and seeing yeah. their whole operation and how they... That was bonkers. How they recruit, and that was bonkers. So, yeah, it's all around us. And it doesn't, it's not just big cities. I mean, don't be fooled. This is happening in the small towns, and I don't want to scare anyone, but this is truly happening everywhere. Yeah, that's, that's the craziest thing about what you're doing as well. Also, if you're doing, like, you know, we have this, like, movie idea, right? The black market is a secret subset where, like, you go up to the wall and press the right brick, and then you see the packing supply company. You're like, wait a minute. <laughs> But yeah. it's like, it's almost simpler than that. And that's, oh. that's why you're saying there's like an infrastructure for all of this, its own economy. That's why it exists. Because if it was like halfway done, it would have been destroyed a long time ago. Yeah. It's like, it is so yeah. smart and thought out. Yeah. I think we have this idea that it sort of happens behind closed doors. But if that was the case, then those doors would have been opened up already. And, you know, law enforcement would be, have been all over that. Um, I think the truth and what we've seen is that it, they happen in plain sight. They happen, you know, out in the open, um, which is actually brilliant on their part. I mean, it, it is. is the best way to run a criminal network is when, you know, everybody just looks like everybody else around them. Um, they're not even trying to hide very much. Um, yeah. yeah. That's so crazy. Yeah. Do you see the world differently having seen all of these things now? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How could you not, right? <laughs> Yeah, and it's not in a depressing and sad way either. I, I hate it when people think that uh, because or, or that the show is sad and depressing, or the message of the show is sad and depressing. It's right, not at all. Um, I didn't think I, so. I think 
No. Yeah. I, I, I think I don't see the world as black and white. Um, I see the world with That's an array clear. of colors. <laughs> That's very clear. Uh, I think that I know where these things are happening and it doesn't make me more fearful of the world. It just makes me more aware. And I also realize, I think being able to connect to the traffickers and the smugglers and knowing why they do what they do. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously there's a lot of bad people out there, but there's also a lot of people operating in these worlds that are very much like us. And knowing them and being able to connect with them and listen to their stories has made me sort of less afraid um, in a way of these worlds. Um, and we, it's actually one of my biggest goals for this show is for people, because I was able to connect to them, I really want viewers to be able to see this these worlds and these people and be able to connect with them as well. Um, sure. Because I, yeah, understanding them is just much more valuable than judging them. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It, it, that was a very interesting thing because you have this idea of something and then the way that you present these things, like I'm watching it and there are times when I was like, first off, are you never afraid? Because <laughs> my God, you're in situations that like they make movies about and you're like, yeah, just hanging out, check out picture with my buds. Like, <laughs> do you not get scared ever? <laughs> I do. There are definitely moments where I get scared. Um, but, you know, in a, in a battle between curiosity and, and fear, curiosity right. on my side always wins. And that's not always a good thing. <laughs> some uncomfortable situations in the past. That's right. Um, You're actually missing a leg. That's why you don't take yeah. any pictures. I get it. I understand. It's worth it. Or missing part of my brain for doing yeah. some of these things. No, but, but I think that it's, it's a calculated, everything we do, you know, no, no story is worth a life. So mm. all of these are very calculated risks. I think what people don't see is sort of the amount of planning and, you know, oh, security point. procedures that go into place before we go into any of these places. And then another thing that, uh, you know, you think you're going, for example, into Sinaloa territory in Mexico. Right. Uh, and you think that, you know, people around there are just because, you know, they, there's a lot of killings uh, happening that they, as soon as you enter they're they're going to kill you and harm you. Right. Um, but what happens actually is that once you're in their territory, once they've allowed you into their territory and they're willing to share their stories, um, you are sort of under their protection. And as oh. the, yeah, it's interesting. And the more you trust them, the more they're likely to trust you. And the more you approach them again with, empathy with trying to understand their stories instead of judgment, Sure. the more likely it is uh, that they will treat you the same way. Um, and again, it doesn't mean I sound like, you know, <laughs> a, a crazy person, a, a bleeding heart, a crazy person, but sure. uh, that doesn't mean that there aren't bad people out there. Of course they are. And there's a, a lot of people doing horrific things and, you know, we were witness to it in our show. Um, but, uh, you know, more often than not, the people operating in these worlds are doing so because of lack of opportunities and the situations around them and the families they were brought in. Sure. It becomes like a, a victim of yeah. circumstance sort of thing. It's like the environment yeah. that you're around, you emulate it. Yeah that's, yeah. that's one of my favorite things about like your work is you really humanize the people, not saying that, oh, this is okay, but you're like, also understand that this is a human being that's doing these things. It's like, the story is king there. And it's interesting. You're not like, here's the thing. Therefore, this is how it is. You're like, but yeah. th there's, there's reasons for all of this. It's fascinating. I love yeah. it. Yeah. It doesn't mean I don't ask them tough questions. I do. That's I, true. I ask everyone I interview, like, don't you, how do you feel about knowing, for example, if you're a drug trafficker, that people are dying because of the drugs you're making or trafficking or this and that? Yeah. Those, those questions are obviously important. And it's my job as a journalist to ask them. Uh, but I ask them with the intention of understanding um, and less right. with the intention of pointing the finger and saying, hey, you bad guy, um, yeah. <laughs> you know? Sure. There, there's moments in the show where like there's an episode when you talked about like uh, talking with the pimps and things where like in the trailers even you've mentioned like, have you ever hit any of your workers? Oh, and they're just God. like, next question. And you're like, what? And then the one person's like, you say they can leave any time, but then you did this like you you're not afraid to at least bounce back a little bit as questions not necessarily call them out because that would be risky no but i call I them out style. i, I call love them it. out there was one the one when the pimp story there was one that was 
actually one of the most challenging for me, which was hearing a pimp story about, I asked him, do you hit your woman too? So I asked that guy and I asked another guy because I wanted to know sort of the level of violence involved, which, right. you know, sex trafficking is the most horrific crime out there. Absolutely. And really, as a woman, especially very hard to, to, um, to report sure. on. And so sitting down with this one pimp who calls himself Jackknife. Yep. And I asked him, uh, you know, have you hit your women? He says, no, I don't touch my women except for that one time. There was one time when one of them yeah. decided to escape or, you know, decided she wanted to go on her own. And I went and I caught her and I cut her feet. Yeah. Um, I said, with a knife? He said, no, with a uh, razor with blade. With a razor, yeah. And that was really tough for me. That I was, bet. you know, again, it's those moments, okay, empathy, I want to try to understand you, but also... Uh, the, the story you're telling me right now is horrifying. Right. And, uh, I can't believe you did this. Um, but then you hear his story. And yeah, again, it's just like one of those moments where you're horrified. And then in the next year, oh, wow, well, that's why. Um, yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, I think that's the skill in and of itself to be able to kind yeah. of hear these stories and package them. And like, also, that's the most horrible thing you can hear. But then it's like, okay, all right, I have to peel back another layer and be like, understand the thought behind this horrible yeah. thing, not negating it, but it's like, no. is it, is that a weird line you have to walk? Like trying to it find is. like the, yeah, you know? yeah, it is. And something, you know, I, I say that I usually tend to, you know, these are people that are opening up their lives to me. So, and I'm there yeah. to listen and I, I sort of, I don't have a hard time connecting, um, mm -hmm. but sometimes I do. <laughs> there have, you know, fair, there fair. have been cases where people that I leave and I'm drained. I'm seriously drained, and I, I, I feel like okay, I, I don't take more time with the person because, uh, yeah, because I'm drained and it's tough. And uh, the, you know, again, there, there truly are bad people out there, and people that you, no matter how much you try to connect, it's it's tough. That definitely exists. So. It takes it takes a lot on, on me and on my whole team, um, for sure. There's, I'd say that the most important part of the day is the beer that we have after we film. Yeah, because <laughs> it's the moment that we sort of sit down and talk and do our little therapy session <laughs> over here <laughs> about what happened that day and how we're feeling and all that. It's sure. It, is it like obviously I'm not a journalist, but is it an interesting line as well because you're covering these things that are black markets that are illegal like do you ever get pushback from like law enforcement or the other way around from things that you're covering from somebody that's also in the world that maybe watches your work and then is like uh what why is this being filmed no so nothing so on the black market world there's nothing that we filmed with the people that sort of gave us access that you Smart. know we go to great lengths to protect their identities yep. um, and change their voices and they are absolutely aware and know exactly what they will look like on camera we show them photos of themselves you know images oh, of smart. what they look before we start filming because we don't want to run that risk and ultimately because it is you know what we've told them is that we are going to protect their identities but right um on the law enforcement side, uh, definitely, there have been situations in which we've been contacted. Um, but you know, uh, it's the most important thing a journalist can do is protect your sources. So absolutely, yeah, we don't we don't give out that information. And again, my 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 our jobs as journalists is not to, um, you know, it, it's to witness what is happening. One of the the things that, for example, we filmed was. Um, a mule who yeah. is a drug smuggler crossing the border from Mexico into the U.S. with her mm -hmm. bag packed with fentanyl. Yep. And I've been reporting on the opiate crisis for many years. Um, and I've seen, you know, firsthand again and again, sort of the impact that it's had on American families. And I've spent a lot of times with moms, for example, who've lost their loved ones in very emotional moments. Um, sure. And seeing this one mule who in this case happened to be a pregnant woman. Mm -hmm. um, crossing the border with her car packed with fentanyl was incredibly hard for me because I was completely torn. On the one hand, um, you know, was sort of had spent uh, some time with her, knew her story, knew what it would mean if she got arrested and what it would mean for her little kids at home. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, knowing what it would mean if the drugs came across and, you know, the real impact that it's having in the U.S., um, and and that was really tough for me. Yeah, sure. it was one of those moments. I was like, I don't, I don't know what I want to happen here. I'm completely torn. Right. When when I was watching it, that was one of the 
most surreal experiences I've had watching a documentary, watching you go through that as well. Cause it's like, yeah, you're like, you have to tell the story and it's, it, it, speaking of the world is not black and white. That's a prime example. You're like, I feel a lot of things right now and I don't know how to unpack yeah. it, but For it's like, sure. you have to bring that up. It's an important topic to talk about. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And it, also interesting in that moment was not, not only what I was feeling, but I kept on thinking if those moms that have lost loved ones to fentanyl yeah. uh, overdoses in the U.S., if they were here and if they were watching me witness this and see this and film this, how would they judge me? What would they think of me? Um, right. it, was, it was tough. It was, it was really tough. <laughs> so yeah. what kind of beer makes that feel better? Oof, the strongest, <laughs> the strongest available <laughs> <laughs> with a side shot of tequila sometimes. that's right hey you got what you had to do i understand <laughs> <laughs> that's bonkers yeah, i think there was a time it might have been the pimp episode when you mentioned that like th it took months like trying to find a contact and oh. find your way in so like what on average what kind of how do you research a black market like what kind of research goes into these things if you can say yeah for sure of course um a lot of it is actually uh, starts with contacting local journalists who've reported on it. Um, you know, the best network uh, around the world is if you're connected to journalists. Sure. It's sort of the best source you can have. And a lot of times, they're the unsung heroes, really. You know, they're the ones that have been reporting on this. They're the ones really taking, you know, the biggest amount of risk by reporting on these stories. You say, for example, you know, a country like Mexico, where, uh, you know, journalists are killed by the cartel for reporting on, on drug trafficking. Right. And, you know, we're the privileged ones that are able to go there, report on this and come back home. But a lot of cases, a lot of times the local journalists stay in the country. So again, one more reason why protecting people's identities and making sure that we're not, you know, pissing anyone off is very important because ultimately we could go back to the local journalists that helped us um so that's oh. incredibly important yeah um but yeah and then that. and then sometimes it's there's no you know when you're doing a story about pimps here in in the u.s there's no real journalist that you can call up and say hey can you share your pimp contacts with me <laughs> right so so it's really more about uh, trying to figure out, okay, if I, if, where, where are pimps advertising their biz? <laughs> and oh, turns yeah. out that in this case, it was on social media. On Instagram, there's all these pimps with profiles who usually, who you actually use social media to recruit women. Um, and we didn't know that was the case, but we started contacting uh, them through several means uh and uh social media and others and then i think we spoke our producer actually laura spoke to like a hundred pimps not i'm not joking wow. mm -hmm. or emailed or contacted somehow a hundred pimps actually she didn't speak she contacted a hundred pimps mm -hmm. or more and then uh to, you know like uh i think 15 or so got back to her i think it was something like that i can't rem remember the exact number and then uh and then just a few actually agreed to sit down with me uh, for an interview. But it was, yeah, people think it's so, you watch the show and you think, wow, that's uh, amazing and so easy. <laughs> but, nah, we get hundreds of no's before we get an yes. Right. That makes sense. I mean, you don't go to like a cartel like lab being like, I just waited at the bus and then just started asking. <laughs> 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 the, the man the the amount of work that goes into i mean really anything entertainment i find it's like if you're watching a package you don't understand the amount yeah. of people and man hours and work that went to giving you that yes nuts. absolutely yeah nuts. absolutely i wouldn't and be able then, to do any of it without my amazing team <laughs> it, it helps no i mean really nobody does anything alone you know yeah. nobody wants to say that but it's true yeah. Teams, it's partly it's partly why I wanted to do TV actually. It's because it's teamwork and I love oh, working. Oh, good it. point. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Yeah, you, you picked the right medium, I think. Mm -hmm. You don't you don't do want you, to be do the one a, person. Do you have a team with you? <laughs> uh I, I kind of uh not for the podcast. No, this is all me. <laughs> it's all you. Yeah, I I don't like sleep and uh I don't do well with uh free time. So I'm like, how can I make another job for myself? Thing. This uh -huh. one. <laughs> So what's your other what's your other job? Uh, I'm an actor, so that you know oh. you don't do any of that by yourself. It's nice. a lot of doing things, and you know I get it—the whole underworld thing. You know, huh? I totally yeah. know what that means. Yeah. That's what I'm talking to you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I'm actually so I'm in Naples, Florida, 
which is an hour and a half away from Fort Lauderdale. So I remember watching the Oxycontin Express and well, it was interesting. (laughs) Speaking of black markets right in front of you, you're like, oh, wow. Okay. I mean, well done. (laughs) Yeah. You live in the part of the United States. So I was listening to somebody say this the other day and it's like right on, like you live in the part of the United States where you almost need a passport to get into because it's so different from yeah. the rest. Florida is such a wild, crazy place. And it's, oh, it you know, is. Yeah. It is. And, yeah. It's and, yeah, bonkers. The, the first time that I reported um, in Florida was, I think it was the first time. Yeah. It was for the Oxycontin Express. It was back in 2009. Ooh. And yeah, it was about the pain clinics in South Florida. It was, yeah, wild. I, I, I remember reading about Oxycontin and thinking, never heard about this. No, don't have no idea what this is. And asking around, like, yeah, I think that's something you give to cancer patients. And then <laughs> sort of looking more into it. And I was like, wait, there's, you know, all these people from all these around the U.S. going to these clinics and waiting in lines. And these clinics are packed and there are security guards standing outside and surveillance systems to go into a pain clinic. What's happening here? Right. And, yeah. Yeah, it turned out it was one of the biggest uh, drug operations in in American history, you know? Isn't that nuts? Yeah, it's nuts. That's so crazy. You're like, this? That doesn't seem right. That's that's security. Hmm. There's a story here. I smell it. (laughs) It was was funny. My wife is a nurse. And so she, when she saw it, she was like, that's why the way things are what they are. <laughs> Cause you know, nowadays it's so like with pain pills, they, right? they went the whole other way. We're like, there are people who really yeah. need it and can't get it now because people yeah. were just reselling it out of their houses. We're like, oh man. But then it goes back to that whole thing where a lot of the people that are reselling are in a financial situation where they can't make up extra money and it's not right, but it's this whole, ah, being a human being is hard, Mariana. It is very hard. <laughs> it's very, very hard. No. It's hard and you're making it more difficult because you're, you're showing that it's gray. All right? I don't know how to process any of this. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny because I think that is one of the things. I think it's just easier for us to think of. A hundred percent. Yeah. Black 100%. and white. A hundred percent. We know our lane. We stick to our lane and it's just we'll never want to go on the other side and, and you know, know more about what we don't have to. Yeah. Yep. That's a bad thing. You're a bad person. I can go to sleep. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then you come along <laughs> with the whole Wait. truth. <laughs> do you do you have you heard about the website? There's a website that you can go to and put your date of birth in Florida and a crazy story comes up about that. Day. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You've done you've read that, right? Do, there's <laughs> so there's every, it's well, you know, listen. So I grew up in Florida. I'm from North Carolina. I moved down here when I was like six. So I grew up here. It's it's strange because I read those headlines and I'm like, I think I've seen some of these. You know, it's like the fact that meth gators, I can't tell you for certainty that they're not a thing. I think that's the problem. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, I, I agree. It's, you're right. It's a, it's a different part of the world with a different breed of people. It really is. Anything wacky? It's actually the best place for a journalist. Like I've I bet. You. Just you're trying to go to cover- the bus station. Wild bulls and black markets go to Florida. Just, oh, yeah. yeah. Go to the gas station. Exactly. Go to the and, gas station. And it's another one of those things. Like you said, it's right in front of you. Like, yeah. I, I had a buddy of mine who was a cop here for a really long time, and he talked about like the amount of times that he would be in a place and it would get to the point where there would be drug runs happening. And he's like, well, I don't want to get shot over this. So <laughs> and I was maybe like, I'll just move my car. <laughs> exactly. I'm just going to go over here. <laughs> I was like, well, I I get it. <laughs> I understand. Florida. Florida man. Florida. Florida. It's, Florida I, man. Exactly. Florida I, man. I remember I watched the show called Atlanta with Donald Glover. Uh-huh. Have you seen that yeah. yet? I, I haven't. I, I think I watched the beginning and it was really good. It's just lack of time. Dude, you got to go and watch just the episode called Alligator Man. It's fantastic, but there's, a part, there's a part where they talk about Florida man. Like his buddy is like a conspiracy theorist kind of person who just says crazy things. And he's like, yeah, I'm going to Florida. And he's like, oh, just watch out for Florida, man. He's like, what is that? And he goes, it's, he, he made it out to be Florida, man, is this like alt-right Johnny Appleseed is what he called him. <laughs> and he, he said it as if every headline with Florida, man, is one person. It's one person. I love it. That's so good. That's so good. 
So they're all the same guy. <laughs> he just goes around. Oh my God. It's so Florida good. man eats a homeless man. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Florida eat. man beats a flamingo to death. What? Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> that is so good. And, and it happens. It happens. That's actually a great idea for a documentary. You guys, you go around and try to figure out who this Florida man is. And then the twist at the end is actually it's all the same person. Hey, I'm so just good. saying, if I get a special <laughs> thanks in the credits, by all means. <laughs> you will, I promise. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. So, I, so you're always, you've got to be like, you've got the Mongolian text things. Are you always on the look for your next story kind of thing? I am. Yes, always. Smart. Smart. It's not very hard to find, though, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 it really isn't. I mean, there's so many black markets and just crazy shit happening all around us. Everywhere, yeah. um, that it's actually not super hard to find. I, I, you know, that it's not which story to do next. It's which story that is uh, worth doing and sort oh, of has an point. impact but also that we know we can sort of try to figure out a way to get access to and that there's a chance that we'll get access to, you know? Right. Um, Which yeah. one's accessible. Yeah. 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 That makes yeah. sense. You don't want to keep hitting yeah. your head against the wall when you have like a queue of ideas. Yeah. You should see my head or my yeah. team's head. <laughs> <laughs> it's like that. There's just string attached to other pictures and you're like, let's do this. Throw a dart. It's that one. <laughs> totally. That's funny. That's I, nice. I'm excited for people to see Trafficked, though. I think it's a great That's idea. Good. I think it's a very, like, congrats to you and the team. I love the show. I got the first, I've seen the first five. I'm very excited oh, nice. to see the rest. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I don't want to Do you have brag. a favorite? I do. Um, can you tell me which one it is? I can. Uh, probably the fentanyl one. Just oh, because good. I was so, like, I didn't know how to feel at the end of it. And then I went around and just, like, sat in it for a while. <laughs> yeah. It's they're, they're all fantastic. Context. You know what? The steroids one, that one really, I, cause I know nothing about any of that. So it was mm -hmm. like, you're like, here's this world. And I was like, there's so many needles going into people in this episode. Oh my God. Insane. Right. And just like, man, not, the dude not being able to breathe for a while. I'm like, what is happening? Yeah. Is nobody, yeah. what? Huh. Yeah. I don't know how to feel. Yeah. They're yeah. all fantastic. Yeah. Like oh, I, I can genuinely say, not, not just cause you're here that every episode was a different topic and I was so excited to watch the next one and like, oh, man, you. the way you packaged it was just, I, the counterfeiting one was like, it's happening right here. <laughs> just, <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was equal parts like, you know, am I taking crazy pills? How is this not me? What is going on? <laughs> But it's fantastic. Oh, you're, you're, you're our best audience. I mean, I mean, again, I don't want to brag, but if there's a contest, I want a shirt. That's all I'm you saying. That's why don't. you're here. You know, I'm just trying to get a shirt out of you. you actually, I, sorry, you want a mask because that's oh, what we do. Yes. <laughs> that's all I wanted. That's it. All right. See you later. Balaclava. You want a balaclava. Yeah. <laughs> it's so good. And then I just found out last week that you're doing a podcast. As well, yes. like the companion piece. How cool. Yeah. So now we're rivals, actually. Oh, <laughs> you know <that>? <laughs> Look at that. Look at that. Yeah. It's uh, my first foray into the podcast. I was actually so nervous. It's So each episode we profile, it's an interview. I sit down with a, a former trafficker and listen to their stories of, you know, they're at their peak uh, and then sort of the downfall um, when it all sure. came crashing down. Oh, um, that's smart. And what a yeah, idea. So, yeah. So it, uh, we, I sat down with uh, Heidi Fleiss, the former madam, Hollywood oh. madam, uh, a former cocaine cowboy, one of the original cocaine cowboys, um, Struggle Jennings, who is the grandson of Waylon, Waylon Jennings, oh. the country singer, and yeah. he's, he was an opiate trafficker, uh, wow. got, did time for Oxycontin trafficking, um, and he's a country rapper as well um, sure. himself. And uh, yeah, so it's about these, it's, you know, spending time with people, listening to their crazy wild lives. And again, ultimately trying to connect with people that we think initially had nothing to do with us, but you learn that you do. Yeah. yeah. But I was, I was so nervous that first interview. I was like, okay, I've done a million, I've done this a million times for TV. I have never done this for a podcast <laughs> and I do not know <laughs> if I'll be able to focus on That's what got you nervous? You've been in black markets for forever? Be like, oh man, uh, audio. <laughs> yeah. You have an idea. That and this. I love interviewing people and I hate being interviewed. Hate it. 
Yeah. <laughs> get so nervous. So. Oh, you're doing amazing. I, well, that's, that's the key, though. That's what I tell people. Is my show, it's not an interview. It's a chat. No, it's not. You yeah, know, I, I, like, because yeah. there are people that are actual journalists and reporters that are good at interviewing people. I'm terrible at it. So I was like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm just going to trick someone to hang out with me for an hour and see what happens. <laughs> oh, you're very good at it. You're I very, mean, very it's, it. I, it's easy be, so when I have someone interesting on because it's called the interesting podcast. So if you're not interesting, I damn myself out the gate. You know, there's a lot of pressure here, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think ultimately everybody has a story to tell. No, do you I agree. That? I totally agree. I, you know what I love, which is one of the things that I think I connected with you the most on through your show is like, people are people, right? Like, yes. you're from Portugal. I'm from here. It's like, we have on paper yeah. probably very little in common, uh -huh. but at the same time, we're the same. And yeah. I, I find that to be a truth that not a lot of people unpack. And I love it. If you can just connect with people on a human level and you do it very well, which is why I threatened that geo um, to get you here. But you know, it's just, that's, that's what life's about, you know, <laughs> threatening <Yeah. your> channels. <laughs> I hope I'm so happy you say that because that is so important for me um, being able to connect people and also getting, I hope you felt like you were, yeah, like you were connected to the people in the show as well, that you were, you know, connecting to the counterfeiters in Peru and to the, you know, teenagers smuggling cocaine out of the Rain Valley in Peru. And yeah, you know, and, it's so crazy. Yeah. You're like, at yeah. the end of the day, they're people. And it's yeah. like, you can, you can understand at the very least, figure out how the math works to get to where they are, as opposed to yes. dismissing them, you know? Absolutely. Because nothing is going to be addressed. The world is not going to change unless we understand how it operates and how it works. Yeah, absolutely. That actually, yeah. that's a good point. So do you have any advice for somebody who like wants to get into journalism or making documentaries? Yeah. Uh, persistence. Definitely. Smart, I mean, smart. Number one, number one thing I learned <laughs> in journalism, definitely persistence. Incredibly important. Uh, just don't give up. If it's your passion, just don't give up. Um, and uh, sort of find something that you're passionate about. Uh, don't don't report on something or you know go out and do a story because uh, everybody else is doing uh, zig when everybody else is zagging. Um, is always a good one for me. Is try to figure out what is it that hasn't been covered. What is it that is sort of happening that I have unique access or a unique understanding or or maybe it's just that I'm uniquely curious about this one subject and really sort of dive deep into it. Um, yeah, and, and, and yeah, dive deep, D dive, and don't be afraid of diving. I think that's oh, a very important. Oh, good point. Good you know, point. Getting, getting, yeah, just doing it. Um, sometimes you just get too wrapped up in the obstacles and um, instead of just taking the leap. Sure, Yeah. sure. Okay. And you're spending so much time on something that like you kinda, you, you better love it because you're gonna be with it for a bit. Yes. Yes, absolutely, for a long time. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's all I do is talk about this, think about this, dream about it. It's, uh, yeah, it's all, it's all it's the time. It's a way of life. That's what it is. It is. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And one thing I would say, just to go pick up, because I do think it's so important, the sort of young journalists listening to these interviews and yeah. being able to, uh, you know, give them some words of advice. One, one thing that, again, talking about the obstacles and, you know, when you're a freelance journalist, uh, you don't get paid any money. <laughs> you just don't. Fair. But you Fair. find out ways to make money. You, you know, in, in Syria, when I moved to Syria and I was a freelance journalist and I was learning Arabic and I had to figure out a way to sustain myself, I bought Syrian carpets. So I would ship them to my mom. She would host these little tea parties and she would sell the carpets and then for double or triple the price and then she would send me back the money and that's how i sustained myself in syria what? while looking for my first idea genius yeah. so it's, if you want it you can get it you can get it i really i'm a true believer in that yeah wow that's so smart that's so smart. look yeah. at you look at you look at you having i wish good i would ideas. have saved i'm about to move <laughs> to my new house i wish i would have saved some of those carpets but <laughs> back ah oh, man <laughs> Hindsight, it's always 2020. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Well, this has been fantastic. We've been talking for an hour already. Look at that. Oh, my God. So fast. We did Brian, it. Brian, I had such a good time. You're a great conversationalist. Oh, I, 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 I practice a lot. <laughs> but no, this was way fun. I really appreciate you giving me your time. Like, this was, this was really, really fun. 
And uh, but before I let you go, uh, I have to ask where can people find you online? Tell me about yeah. traffic, the podcast. Give me your stuff. Absolutely. Yes. Uh, Instagram and Twitter, it's Mariana VZ. Love it. And uh, Facebook, Mariana Van Zeller. Uh, also have a website, marianavanzeller.com. But mostly where I really want people to find me is on uh, National Geographic on Wednesdays at 9, 8 central, starting December 2nd, uh, where you'll be able to watch Traffic with Mariana Van Zeller. I'm so excited. And then on Thursdays, we drop a new episode every Thursday. For oh, the podcast, sweet, of the sweet. podcast, a podcast episode. Yeah. I have to make that distinction between the TV show and the podcast. That's right. Very different. Yeah. And you yep. can find that anywhere. Spotify, oh, cool. Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah. Beautiful. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And... <laughs> Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at brianbalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. I've also got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Bernice, Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.